Hello and welcome to another episode of Back of the Net and Beyond. And today I'm going to be speaking to ex-teammate and former professional footballer, Rob Purdy. How are you doing, Purdy? You okay? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. All good. And how are you coping with things at the moment with lockdown? And I know you've got a couple of kids as well, so pretty much the same yeah. scenario as me. Yeah, it's, it's been all right. It was hard to start off with with the adjustment. My little girl's five, so she's at that age where she's interested but doesn't quite get stuff and everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think what I've realised is as well, I need to start doing more in my life because lockdown hasn't really changed my day to day. I need to be more sociable, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're healthy, which is the main thing, so we can't grumble about anything. Yeah, happy days. That's the main thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, pretty much the same as me. I've got two kids, and like, kind of one's slightly older than. Than the other one and it's, it's just about finding that balance but i'm enjoying it i mean i don't know whether it sounds good or not i'm, I'm kind of used to not working at the moment i'm trying to adapt to other things and just spend some time with the family which i don't always get an opportunity to do so um but yeah um just if you want to just speak to us let everyone know kind of just a bit about yourself kind of what you're currently doing at the moment and then we'll go from there really yeah i mean i'm uh, i've been retired from from football now for pretty much two years two years at the end of this season, what would have been around now anyway. Um, moved into, uh, I managed to get a job as a firefighter, which was a huge, huge thing for us because it's a good career, which was of course. work. But yeah, but I, I loved my career. I had times, times when I didn't like it. I mean, you know, like, you can have a game and you're the best thing ever and everyone loves it. And then you have, two weeks later, you have a stinker and all of a sudden yeah. you shouldn't be yeah. and it's, Honestly, the, the roller coaster of emotions yeah. that you go through. And everything. But yeah, I, I'm happy with the career that I had. I think I, I probably played to the level which my ability could have. You know, like I don't think I was one of those players that wasted his ability. Yeah, uh, I think I got to where I did. And then, as I say, going now into into firefighting, it's like a totally different job change. Loads of links from football to firefighting, though, that I had to I had to put my point forward to get the job. Yeah. Um, you know, there was like a thousand applicants and I got in the top six. Really? So, wow. yeah, and obviously to do that, when someone said, wow, you used to be a footballer and now you're a firefighter, there was a, yeah, I said, yeah, but the intrinsic actual links of working in a team and blah, 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 That's which we'll probably do, is big, you know? Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a big difference in danger and importance, but the little, like, uh, the little parts of it is, is, uh, is good. And I'm, 30, 37 now, so yeah. to fall into a career like that after football, which a lot of people can struggle to find, mm. uh, I got I got lucky to be fair, yeah. That's massive, and I love that initially you spoke about obviously the transferable skills, and that's the message I'm trying to get across, because if you look at, I'd probably say 99% of um, the public out there, if they look at footballers, the last thing they would think that they'd be doing when they come to retirement, or even considering them, would be to go into firefighting like yourself. So, again, a lot of a lot of people and a lot of sports people in general, they just aren't aware of the transferable skills, which a lot of industries are kind of looking for now. And what I've noticed since I've kind of uh, retired, what maybe seven years now, um, speaking to a lot of kind of industry leaders and stuff, a lot of them are looking to seek ex-professional um, sports people just because they've naturally got those kind of transferable skills within their psyche. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to just talk to us then, um, we'll touch back on what you just mentioned towards the latter part of the, the conversation. But if you want to talk to us about kind of the early years, you growing up, um, kind of were you into sports? And was it like just one sport as in football or just a general? Yeah, like, my, my brother's two years older than me, so I just followed whatever he did. Mm. Uh, and he, he liked to play football, so I started playing with him. And the time was different back then, so say so probably at eight years old. I'm literally leaving the house on a Saturday at nine in the morning, just saying to my mum, we're around the back. <laughs> Can't do it with kids now, you know, you, yeah. want to be, you don't want them out and about by themselves. I just, my mum would say, just be back for dinner. So That's I'd be it. gone from like nine until one o'clock. I'd have, mm -hmm. have a quick sandwich and that, and then I'd be straight back around the back of the shops. That's um, it. And yeah, just literally a whole day playing football. Mm -hmm. um, then I'd get home, watch football, Sunday, mm -hmm. uh, uh, football Italia on. Mm. Uh, that's where that's where I started to enjoy football. I watched a lot more Italian football than than English. Yeah. I think my age, like my first big thing I can remember is Italia ninety. Yeah. So, 
So then after that, obviously, it was just all Italian football, all the old Italian greats and that. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I think I was back then again as well. They didn't have like under fives, under sixes, things like that. If you lived in Leicester, you couldn't. It's not like they'd have a, a West Brom branch in Leicester or anything like that, like they do now. Mm. So I think when I was nine, I played Sunday League kids football and uh, someone knew me from a couple of years ago when I was playing leagues higher and he just said, oh, look, uh, uh, told the Leicester scout to have a look at me and I think I scored six on the day. I was a striker. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Round was, yeah good day. And, uh, and I got lucky. With, I got, I'm happy that I got with Leicester as well. I mean, you'll know uh, from your time with like Nishi and Nev, yeah. uh, Booker, John Rookin and that, you know, I think we got bought up right at Leicester. That you do, you do your job, you work hard, and then if you've got a bit of ability on top of that, then you've got a chance of having a career. Yeah. Um, nowadays, it's a bit more kind of show reel, you know, like YouTube clips. And I, I was watching a YouTube clip of Pirlo, unbelievable, yeah. today. And I was thinking, I could have a YouTube clip like that. Yeah. I didn't do it every, every game, and I didn't do it every 10 minutes like it. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I think everyone likes a little highlight reel now, and I think that's when I fell out of it. But as a kid, yeah. As a kid, it was just, right, you know, who's my favourite player now? Lee Sharp. Okay, I'll try and be Lee Sharp for mm. man of back of and that. Um, yeah. And it's nice to run that because, as I say, kids don't get that anymore. You know, they've got to go to organised sports with their parents and all the time. And that. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot more kind of stringent. I mean, with my kids, I, to be honest, I don't really let them out and play as such. For me, like you saw, it was a case of, right, I'm going out now. And then your parents just say, right, either come in for dinner or lunch or come in when it's, when it's dark and the lights are on. And that was my yeah. thing. And even then, sometimes I'd, I'd ignore it. But my parents would kind of know I'm still safe. I uh, had a group yeah. of friends like in and around the street where I lived and stuff. So everyone knew everyone and everyone's parents knew everyone. So it was one of those things. But it, it's slightly different now. And in some ways, that's kind of detrimental to uh, well, up and coming like sports stars in the future. But... Again, they've got everything online and everything's kind of more accessible. We didn't really have well, nah. online, no YouTube or anything. So if we were to watch, say, Brazilian Ronaldo, it would have to be on TV, um, on yeah. football or something, once a week, maybe. I don't know, was it Saturday or Sunday? I can't quite remember when it came on. So to access those types of players who aren't kind of readily available or weren't readily available to us at that point, it was a case of we had to stay up and either watch it or record it and watch it the next day. Whereas now, a few clicks of uh, the iPad or, or laptop and then you're there straight away. Uh, yeah. So yeah like we used to watch the whole game. You know, yeah. like we couldn't watch to watch like a highlight show of uh, one player or anything like that. It was like sit down and watch the whole 90 minutes of the game and, exactly. and pick your best room. Whereas, exactly. yeah, like you said, just type in, you know, Zidane or something like that, R9, and then you get his like two minute blasts of them and that we didn't get a chance for that. Exactly, exactly. So just touching on obviously Leicester, obviously you're from Leicester you mentioned and you managed to obviously play for uh, your local club. What was it like when they kind of, I'm assuming, either wrote you a letter or made the call and to say, look, we want you to come and join us? How did that feel? Yeah, it was good. You know, I mean, it was kind of informal back then mm. um, because, because as I say, they just, they're just not the infrastructure that there is now. Mm. But I think, uh, I think, it must have been, it must have, I think the scouts came back another game and spoke to my dad, you know, literally just yeah. like that. Yeah. Said, oh, you want to come down? Because I, I don't think we had games until we were like under 12s, under 13s or anything like that. Just training. But I was there from nine till obviously a uh, youth team. And then I got released at 19. Um, mm. And I was one of the, I think I was probably the only one who got there at nine and went through the whole way. You know, so many players come in and out. Well, you, know, you, ask, you ask anyone, I'm mean, had trials at this club, this club. And you're like, yeah, I must have played with hundreds of players over those, over those uh, eight years of nine to 17 before mm -hmm. the youth team. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I mean, every, you know, if, for me back then, I think as well, like I didn't have the aspirations at nine is what kids do now. Like, because you like, can say they can watch and see the money and everything. Back then, I didn't know what the money was when I was nine, yeah. you know different time so uh, for me it was just like oh brilliant okay I've got to play for Leicester and I went and played for Leicester and then I kind of grew into it over the years and then it, it started to become something that I wanted to do more yeah. and more and yeah. um, I think just back then everything was a lot more innocent you didn't like I say you know, 
you didn't see the flash cars, you didn't see the mansions on mm. TV or anything like that. So you didn't really know the aspect of it until you get to like 13, 14, and then you start to go to more of the games, you start to realise the that. That's true. I mean, in terms of me, pretty much the same. I mean, when we were, when I was kind of eight, nine, ten, and I first started training with a few professional clubs, because back then you didn't have to be necessarily tied to one club. I could train with two or three. Um, didn't really sign any forms or anything until the latter part, just before you say, I don't know, start your apprenticeship. And I didn't really see any first team players face to face or kind of in the distance. Um, when we were training, it was kind of in the evenings. Didn't see any flash cars or anything. So there was no influence from that perspective. And obviously nowadays, it's different. And you touched on aspirations for yourself at that age. Sometimes I think nowadays, because I'm hearing stories where there's a young kid um, who's got, I don't know, a lot of talent or whatever it may be. And then they're getting picked up at such a young age and then parents are getting offered houses and things like that. And it's like, it's hard yeah. to turn down, especially in this day and age as a parent where you may be not from an affluent background, you may not have the finances to maybe cope on a monthly basis. And if a club comes knocking for your son or daughter at that point and they say, look, you need to relocate and we're going to give you a nice three or four bedroom house, it's hard to say no to that. And sometimes the player may not even be aware of these things and it's more motivation for the parent to then push their son or daughter into that field and yeah. it, sometimes a child can get lost in that and again what if it doesn't work out at the last stage and then things obviously change there's a lot of up and ups and downs as you know in football it's not always plain sailing um, so from that age I mean I didn't really have any rejections at that age and I, I don't know maybe that's down to ability I know some players got taken on and let go and then just fell out of the game, even at eight and nine. Um, not even really talking about teenagers. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it's definitely tough. Yeah, I mean, I was the same as you, you know, because I think because I got there so early and I was always, I, there wasn't like a point between nine and the youth team where I thought I wasn't going to stay on. You know, mm. I, was, I was one of the better ones and... Uh, yeah. Lad to come in, have a good player come in, and then he wouldn't make it because his attitude wasn't right, or yeah. he just didn't do it and stuff. But I agree with what you say as well about aspiration now, because there are kids now who all they want to be is a footballer, mm. and that, that is it. So they practice, they practice, they practice, because the standards up now. I think from when we were young, you know, athleticism, skill, everything like that. Yeah. You know, the, game, the game's evolving and stuff. And mm. um, I know a couple of couple of uh, mates who have got kids in their youth team setups and it's like I look at the kids sometimes and I think right what's going to happen if you get to 15 16 and then there's no youth team contract exactly and then then you're just literally in a huge pond of fish that are trying to scramble to get deals and that mm -hmm. I, you know, I worry for a lot of kids like that it was never like that for me but I don't know whether like you say it was kind of because I kind of didn't think it would happen to me mm -hmm. uh, until I got in the youth team, I kind of thought, oh, yeah, I'll be all right at Leicester. I'll, I'll get to that stage and it's how far can I go? Mm. Um, but, yeah, it, it, is, it is a totally different ball game to when we used to play, 100%. I'm guaranteed that the generation before us say exactly the same. Exactly the same, yeah. They are so different. You're lucky, you're lucky. Whereas now we're like saying to some kids, look, you're yeah. lucky because you can, you know, youth, youth team contracts now, you've got young lads on a lot of money. Nice. Whereas when I signed, it was £75 a week, I think, something like that. Uh, living at my room, catching the bus to train and stuff. Nowadays, yeah. kids weren't have been dead on the bus at 17. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a generational thing. And I mean, that's just circumstantial. There's nothing that anyone can do about that. But I mean, for me, um, again, it was just a case of just playing. I, I didn't have that kind of. I wouldn't say incentive. I didn't have that pressure from parents just because they didn't know anything about football. So for yeah. me, it was a case of if I went and played well uh, and then came home and I said, look, I've scored two or three, they'd be like, great. And then it was a case of, because my parents were like, say, church goers, it was just a case of, right, I need to go to church now. I need, to be honest, I nearly didn't play just because Sunday league is obviously on a Sunday and I used to have to go to church in the morning and in the afternoon. And it wasn't for... My older, I was basically my older brother who came out and said, Look, he's got a talent here. People were talking. Nice. Said, Look, maybe he can go in the morning and then just go in the afternoon to play football. And then he, if he has to go to church in the evening, then just go to church in the evening. So if it wasn't for my older brother, I probably wouldn't have even played. 
uh, from right, my yeah. perspective, I was kind of lucky. Um, so I'm I mean, similar. I'm similar. You know, my dad, my dad didn't like football. He never used to watch it. Never used to play it when he was a kid. Yeah. Uh, obviously, my mum was the same as well. Never, never bothered with it. My brother probably stopped playing at about 13, 14. Mm. Um, so, so I was the same. I didn't have a dad saying uh, like, you know. You were you were poor today. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You've got to start doing this. My dad, I don't even know whether he watched the games. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like you know, he 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 obviously was interested in it, wanting to see me do well, but he wasn't mm. pushing. Yeah. And uh, and that's probably the same now with uh, this generation. You've got dads that see it and they see what could happen and they see what the mm. the money was for them and everything and they try and push people into it. Yeah. And I think, yeah. and I think that's sometimes when you get the players with. A little bit of ability that don't quite get the work rate because they fight that because they've always had their dad doing it, so they fight against it when they get yeah. a little bit older. Yeah, uh, you, I don't need your help now, dad. You know that type of thing. Yeah, that's a good point. To be fair, uh, I mean, I suppose it can work both, both ways. To be honest, I mean, if you've got a parent who's kind of I don't know, not pushy, but knows a bit about the game, knows a bit about kind of the psyche and the level of mentality needed, as well as ability. To maybe coach you in that direction, then fair enough. I mean, I always had my brother who would, he wouldn't necessarily say, "Look, he played well," or he didn't. He would just say, "It was mainly, did you enjoy it?" Um, it never really came up and said, "Oh, like you could have done this or made this pass." It wasn't that analytic for me. It was just a case of kind of enjoying it, um, and I always did. Um, and I get people asking me now, kind of people my age and older, and they, they say, "Look, I've got a young son or daughter," um, and I always say, "Look, how old?" Um, some of them have. I don't know, 10, whatever. And I say, look, two main things is just enjoy it um, and obviously just try your best. And that's it. So I'm assuming that they're trying to gauge or trying to get more out of me as in, okay, what can they do to make it? And at that age, yeah. you just need to enjoy it. Point was going yeah. into tactics and everything else. It's just a waste of time. Oh, yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll know from, from the age of 10 to the age of 35 when I retired, Mm. If I'm in a team where I'm not enjoying the, my football, my performance drops. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably where the elite, elite players, mm. uh, they're like ahead of like even world-class players. I'm doing like Ronaldo, Messi, yeah. uh, Aguero, Suarez, people like that, because they don't have off games. Mm. You know what I mean? Like they, because they, everyone, everyone has problems at home every now and again and stuff like yeah. that. We want to be the best player they go to ever to go on that pitch every single game, and yeah. that's a hard mentality to keep as well. You, know, you always want to do well, but I've had games where I'm like, God, I'm just tired today, you know, yeah. and you start, you start to kind of make an excuse already, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know, so I might just ease off a little bit today. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and elite players don't have that, they're just on it all the time, yeah. And even if they do have a bit of an off game, um, for them, uh, at their level, they normally have at least one impact on the game, whether it be scoring a goal or an assist or doing a bit of skill or doing something. Um, yeah. But one thing that I always touch on with people as well, because there's an old, there's an old adage in football, as you know, play as long as you can. Um, yeah. That's great when you're at the top. And I always say that's great when you're in any field, be there as long as you can. But for us, I mean, I've experienced it. I know you have getting changed in port cabins and, you have to be yeah. early to make sure you get all the kit because if you get there like on time, you may have odd socks or something. We always yeah. had, well, not always, in the latter part of my career, I had those things to contend with, and that's not easy. Um, different managers operate in a different way. I had various, mm -hmm. well, I had one particular manager who would, before a game, so yeah, I mean, yeah, literally before a game on the day, it'd say, like, you're not, you're not playing today, but you're going to play next week or in the next game and I'll be like I don't understand Never. how you can say I'm going to play in the next game just because purely that means already you need to drop someone and what if the person who you were going to drop has a blinder or something then what you just create yourself problems there's little things like that that happen in say the lower leagues of football which don't necessarily happen in the higher echelons of football or even in yeah. sport um, and a lot of people from the outside looking in won't necessarily see that and again mentally you have to contend with those things. Um, I mean, I've been off the contracts before. And as you know, you, you negotiate as best as you can. New manager comes in, doesn't really fancy you. And that contract is no longer there. It's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, honestly, like, I think, uh, I think 
uh, de depression is like a big thing to talk about and depression is like there's a, there's a levels of depression Mm. But football is such a roller coaster of mm. uh, elation, and then I say the word depression, but I don't mean it as serious as what you know mm. you can get you can get in the world. But those days where you know you have a bad game, manager hammers you, uh, you you feel like you've lost the respect to the players a little bit for making mm. the mistake losing a game or something, and then uh, so you go home, your re weekend's ruined. Then you've got to go in Monday. And you're still a little bit like, are people still going to be mad at me? Is the, is yeah. the manager going to talk to me today? Or is mm. he just going to walk past me in the corridor? Um, and things like that. And the, those like ups and downs of football are, are crazy. And, it, and like you say, it can just be a different manager, a different mindset, or mm. a player that comes in and he's a big, big, uh, big personality. And that imprints on everybody around you. And then the dynamics change and stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, if you get the right recipe, then you get success. But if you get the wrong one, then that's why teams struggle. You know, you play in teams where you think the ability in this team is unbelievable, but if it's the, not the right manager or not the right message or the dressing yeah. rooms, then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're not picking up results, no one's enjoying football, and yeah, your career can get a bit tougher. Exactly. I mean, I always say you need a thick, a thick skin in sport anyway. Um, 100% back that to the hill. Um, and again, it, it just depends. I mean, I never suffered from any kind of mental health issues when I was playing and obviously luckily um, obviously outside of football when I obviously approach retirement and current, currently doing what I'm doing at the moment I haven't experienced anything um, and that's just me personally um, but as you know it's more prevalent nowadays people are coming out and expressing their feelings more and it's more kind of welcomed and uh, that's another thing in sport I mean I always reference football just because naturally that's what I was involved in um, and I never really I think the first person I came across when I was playing was Stan Collymore um, yeah. actually at Leicester. Um, yeah. Actually, no one really knew. People had heard stories about his private life. And to be honest, Stan was a class player, as we all know. And I, to be honest, I got on with Stan anyway when I was kind of in and around the first team for that small period. Um, but obviously, when he came out, that was a massive thing. And that was probably one of the first people I came across um, when I was involved in, in football that came with came out and said, look, they, they suffer from uh, bouts of depression and things like that. Uh, yeah. But in, in terms of kind of um, your playing career, um, obviously at Leicester, so you're at Leicester now, obviously you're in the youth team and kind of you touched on the coaches um, that you had when you were, I think they were the same as uh, the ones that I had, yeah. Dave Nish, uh, Neville Hamilton, um, and a couple of others. Um, so how did you find your time, obviously growing up in the youth team, kind of who you playing with? Kind of things like that. Yeah, I mean, you kind of uh, you, you always want to go back and think because we had fun, you know. Like every day, you're turning up with your best mates. Like from the from when I from when I signed in the youth team, I didn't really see anyone that I used to make, I know at school or anything like that. Yeah. Youth from all of your mates, mm. and so it was like it was just a laugh. Like mm. we had so much fun before training, after training. I thought Nishi was great. I didn't realise how good Nishi was until he left. Mm. Because I saw like the respect that I had for him. That because mm. uh, I was scared of Nishi. You yeah. know, like, <laughs> he'd, he'd never really shout, but there were, I remember him stood on top of the hill at Leicester's training ground. He'd yeah. get the ball, throw his arms up in the air, and turn around, and you just mm. know, you know, you're annoyed. I remember that he used to, yeah, he used to go out and then do the three sixty. Yeah, <laughs> stood there with his umbrella. Mm. Um, uh, and then when uh, when he left and we had Steve Beagle and Alan Hill come in, there was a totally different dynamic there. Mm. And they were a little bit more friendlier and everything like that. But I just, I loved my three years. And I think the problem with it in the youth team, I didn't even contemplate it ending. Mm. I, didn't even look, I didn't even look to say, well, in three years, my contract's up. So what am I going to do? Anything like that. I was just enjoying it. It was like the best time yeah. ever. I had holidays in the summer, mm. uh, learning trade. I was lucky enough that I was always playing, so I was never kind of like really on the bench in the youth team. I was always mm. getting a, I was getting a little look in at the 19s with, with you guys and Stixies yeah. and, and uh, everyone like that, Pipes and Jord, and yeah. uh, and I was like sniffing around training with the Reses. So I was always kind of like kind of mm. good enough for me not to worry. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously. 19, so uh, my last year in the youth team, I was told, I think at Christmas, that I wasn't going to get a pro. Mm. Uh, and again, it didn't really bother me. I think I was just a young kid just enjoying mm. 
enjoying playing football with my mates. Yeah. Um, a few things happened between then and the end of the season, which I was disappointed in with the club. Mm. Uh, with uh, there was a few things said and a few things that didn't come out and stuff. Um, but then when when coming into the end of that season, that's when it just hit me. It was like, wow, okay, you know, I mean, since that youth team, Danny, I mean, I played. I came to Bournemouth on trial with you. Oh yeah, I remember that. Played with you and P. Was it TK? TK, yeah, in the Dukes. Wow. Yeah, so I stayed with you for like three or four days, I think. Could bit of training and that. Yeah. Um, and then you obviously came to Hereford probably ten years ago, and when it something like that, eleven years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, I've never seen you. Mm. So you hit that nineteen, and all of a sudden you you you're like, oh, I've got to find another club. Yeah. And, and you don't realise, like you say to all the boys, hey, listen, yeah, well, we'll have to meet up, we'll have to go and do this, we'll do that. And then it just doesn't happen. And that, that every single year in your career, you play yeah. with 20 players, 10 of them get released, oh, mate, look, we'll go and do this in the summer. Yeah. Or, yeah, we'll get a night out, it never happens. Yeah. So it was a big shift. And I didn't have an agent. Um, uh, I never needed one at Leicester because I'd just gone up. Mm. Uh, through the room. so I didn't have an agent so I was kind of just on my own I was lucky that I found Hereford it was in the end mm. because that kind of landed on my doorstep uh, mm. when I was literally at the point where right, I need to sign on to job seekers now and really? uh, try and try and find another job I was literally at that point yeah um, which was which was scary mm. all, of a, all of a sudden everything that I'd done for the last 10 years uh, yeah, wait. It was just gone, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like literally, because I went for a trial at Hereford, played against Burton and Albion. Mm. Alan Hill sorted it out because he knew the, he knew Hereford scout. They offered me a deal in the summer. I said no because York and Lincoln wanted me to go there pre-season. Right, okay. Mm. So I went Lincoln with Keith Alexander, mm. and uh, and I'm like the opposite of a Keith Alexander player. Same here. I played yeah. under him, and yeah, it's just it's one of those things as you, as you, as I mentioned earlier. Different managers have different ways of playing, and I knew. Literally, when I was at Macclesfield, I was flying, and there was wind of kind of him taking over as manager. And I knew straight away, even though I was like flavor of the month to a certain degree, I knew that when he came, I'd have to potentially prove myself to him. Uh, yeah, it was just tough. Um, but yeah, sorry to cut you. Yeah, carry on. No, no, because because that's what you mean about being fixed in. Because you know, for every every person in football that says, "Oh, look, you were great," or you know, you've got this ability. You've got exactly the same amount of people saying you're not good enough. You don't do this well yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, and I think as long as you can understand it, it's not going to affect you. Like I spent a week at Lincoln and then played two played two games and came up to me and said, "Look, Rob, Rob, I think you're a good little player. No yeah. problem with you. I think you're neat and tidy on the ball, but you're just not really going to fit into what I'm doing." Yeah. Um, and I understand. I didn't understand at the time because I didn't know much about him or or Lincoln. Yeah. But then, you know. You, you get to learn when you play against those teams and you think, ah, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's get it up to the front man work on flick on. Yeah, like they always, uh, it was him and, um, I can't remember his first name, but his surname was Simpson. We used to call him Simo, his assistant. And their style of play was just, they liked big players, big, physical, strong players. And they yeah. probably had, they used to play, I think it was 4 3 3, and they normally had like two speedy guys as one of the, the flankers of the three up front. Um, and luckily, that's where I like kind of squeezed in when he came. Um, but yeah, the first two games, I'd gone from playing like starting every game and playing every minute almost, to then just not even being in the squad. I think we played two yeah. away games. We got to a point where fans were thinking like, like, where's Danny? Is he injured? And I weren't. I just wasn't in the in the squad just because he didn't fancy me. And luckily uh, for me, the team lost both games, and then he put me in the next game. So his third game in charge, I think, and then we drew. And then from then I carried on playing, but I always saw it as like an uphill battle. And then, yeah. like I said, at that point I was already in contract negotiations. It was around, I'd probably say, the turn of the year. I can't, I can't quite remember the, the date. And um, yeah, and they'd already kind of offered me something new. Um, but yeah, he came in, and then it was it was slightly different. Everyone's contract was under review and things like that. So it was nothing really new to me because I, I kind of experienced it before. I mean, touching on what you're saying about kind of being let go at Leicester, I had experienced that early, early doors, but it was my own choice. So I, I grew up like you, you were at Leicester, I was at Nottingham Forest. Uh, yeah, yeah. I had my apprenticeship there. And it was my first pre-season, so I just left the FA National School 
I was injured. I had a hairline fracture in my back, and that's my first major injury. <clears throat> so imagine going into it, start your apprentice with, say, new teammates and obviously some ones that you're familiar with. We have a new management come in. So all the people that have kind of um, I've grown up with at Forest, being my coaches and stuff, they had all been let go. Paul Hart right. came in from Leeds with a massive reputation because if you imagine Leeds' youth team, they had like Alan Smith, Harry Kuehl and Woodgate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so they he, he came in with his backroom staff and bought a lot of players from Ireland and throughout the country um, to join our our team and a lot of players who were decent who I'd grown up with got let go um, but I, I had a contract and stuff but I was injured so imagine starting your first ever pre-season being injured and I was playing catch up for, for months after that and we had millions of players like an A and a B team in the youth team yeah. ridiculous yeah. never seen anything like it so um, and that was a new thing brought in at that stage um, I just I had three years on my contract. I went in, long story short, and I just said, look, I'm not happy. Can you just tear my contract up? And I'm 16 at this point. No parents around me. I didn't consult anyone. I just went in and did it. Because I had, I backed my own ability. So I knew yeah. that once I got fit, I'd be able to hopefully find a club. Easy to do when you're just looking after yourself because I had no dependents, no yeah. mortgage or anything, no rent, uh, no bills, essentially. I had no mobile or anything. So it was a case of just finding another club. And that was it, going home and, and getting on the phone. And that's what I did. And that's what I encourage players to do now, essentially. Because a lot of them a lot of them are just relying on their agents. Some of them don't even need agents, like you said earlier. It's, it's just, yeah. Sometimes you have to take things upon yourself and obviously go about things yourself, essentially. Yeah, agents are great um, and they do what they need to do. But if you're a lower league player, essentially, you're not going to be earning your agent any money anyway. So why is he or she going to be putting effort into finding you, you another club. Uh, yeah. It just doesn't make sense financially from their perspective. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I left Forest and I rang around and I was going on trial to various different clubs, Derby, Cobb, uh, Man City, I think I went to Stoke. And then I, as I was going from club to club, I was getting fitter and fitter. Um, and I think I think it was, so Stoke was before Leicester and Stoke were kind of coming and hour and about kind of wanting to retain me. And something just didn't fit right with me. And then I thought, let me try Leicester. And I went to Leicester. And from the first day, I just thought, this just seems right to me. Uh, yeah. All the boys and everyone were like fine. And the, the training ground wasn't far from my house and things like that. So everything just seemed to, to fit in. And they managed to, well, I performed on the trial. And they just said they wanted to retain me. And I was happy. And then it just went from there, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, not everyone has gone through that experience like say like myself and like yourself and I was lucky enough to do it at a young age and it worked out for me and that I'm, I'm assuming that kind of st stood me in good stead going forward for potential rejection or kind of misdemeanors or whatever happening throughout my career um, so I mean you mentioned obviously you went through the youth system at, at Leicester and then you left and went to Hereford and then you're kind of a Hereford legend now. Um, even when I went there, I think around 2006, you were already a kind of a legend there, played millions of games and whatever else for the club. Uh, how was your time at Hereford? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, I mean, I spent, I think it was about 11 and a half years there. Mm. And that's in, that's in three, diff, three or four different spells. Mm. Um, uh, when I got my try and then obviously, like I said, so that summer, uh, Lincoln didn't work out. Mm. York, uh, York said they have budget problems, which I learned after a while it means that you, you're not good enough for us to give you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I've got to go back in the budget. If, if they wanted me, they would have offered me a deal. It's as simple yeah. as that. And if they, had, yeah. if they obviously had the budget issues, you wouldn't be there in the first place. They'd just say, look, we can't afford to bring you in. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so I went, into, went back into Leicester to see the boys. Mm. And uh, still on Hill, and he said, "Oh, well, do you want me to give Hereford a ring for you again." So I said, yeah. "Yeah, fine." I think like what you said about ringing people. A lot mm. of players, a lot of players don't want to swallow their pride and actually do it themselves. Yeah. Mm. You know, I'm not ringing them if they wanted me. They'd ring me and things like that okay. type thing. Don't it's work like that. Yeah. If you're not like top of their list, uh, yeah. you've got to you know, put your graft in yourself. Mm. So yeah, so signed for Hereford first season. I think I only started about eleven games. I was literally just a kid trying to get used to a man's game. Mm. Totally different. 
totally oh, different. Oh, oh. Uh, trying to find my position as well because I was a striker when I was a kid. I'd moved back to centre mid at Her- uh, uh, in the youth team at Leicester. Mm. And then all of a sudden, I'm like 10 stone centre mid in the conference, which is full of six foot three <laughs> midfielders. <laughs> the box. Good luck with that one. Oh, mate, I was just getting bumped off. It's like when I, first, when I got released by Leicester, sorry, going back to that, he was saying, oh, look, uh, they said I was small. Okay, yeah, and people said, oh, that's got nothing to do with it. And then I was thinking, uh, you put me next to, like, Vieira, because he's playing in the Prem at that time, and I am going to get ragdolled everywhere. There's no chance. Mm. Um, you've got to be extra special if you're, if you're not got, you know, people who have got six foot two, six foot three, and the athleticism and the touch and stuff like that, then, yeah, that's why you're playing top level. Exactly. Um, uh, but, yeah, so first year, second year, I kind of blossomed. I played up front. We had a couple of injuries. So he, so he put me up front in pre-season and I had a really good season. Mm. Uh, probably, probably almost the best season of my career. Really? Um, yeah, we finished second in the league. Um, we'd done really well. I got injured in the first leg of the playoffs. We got knocked out of the playoffs. I came back the following season was... And I was still injured. Uh, the, physio, the physio left at the end of the season, so I didn't get any treatment. And I think I just had scar tissue all around my foot. And, uh, and I think that, that was probably my chance to get back higher than probably what mm. I played around because Charlton were in the Prem and they came to watch me pre-season. Oh, wow. and, but the manager didn't believe that I was injured. So I was playing, but I couldn't kick the ball with my left foot. And I'm right-footed, but I'm comfortable enough on my left. Yeah. And I remember even putting the ball on my left foot to do a diag and I went to kick it and I just stopped because I didn't kick it with my left foot. Yeah, yeah. Got tackled, Jeez. crowd, crowd, woo, oh, you know, wow. straight from the back and that. Yeah. Uh, and it took me probably, I think, about a month into the season and then manager finally said, look, if you think you're injured, then go and get yourself fit because you're no use to me at the moment. Wow. And that was my third season, that. So I came back and then I heard him say to the fit man, he's come back a different player. I think I'm just fit. He just mm. didn't, you know, he just didn't understand it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I spent five years there. And then you came in the fifth year, I think, when we were in the league. Mm. Uh, and again, I was the only one left from that first year to the fifth year. So we got promoted into the league. Uh, we had a good team, good team spirit and everything. And then uh, end of that season, I left. Uh, I think we got, pretty sure I got player of the year. I think me and Tam got joint player of the year and stuff. Mm. Um, and I left then to go to Darlington. They had a, a bigger budget. They they looked like a bigger club and stuff. And I think at the same time, yeah, and I got, I'd got a little bit, not stale at Hereford, but I kind of was in that mode where, okay, I'm definitely going to start next season. You know, yeah. I'm one of the first on the team sheet. And I just felt that I'd end up relaxing. I wanted a new challenge. Yeah. I went up there for two years and again, did really well. Got player of the year in my second year. Yeah. Um, fitted in really well up there and really enjoyed my time. And then my manager at the time, Dave Penny, went over to Oldham in the summer and he took me to Oldham. Oh, okay. uh, nice. Yeah, they were league, yeah, league one at the time. So I was like, okay, yeah. Yeah, I remember, you see, I remember seeing that, actually. Oh, and uh, and I, was, I was real up for that. Like, I had the, uh, he gave me the number 10 shirt and that was like my favourite number. I thought, right, I'm totty now. I've made it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no more years of being number 16 or 17. I'm number yeah, 10. Yeah. Um, and I got injured first day of pre-season. First day. Just had this pain in my groin. And then didn't train. Did not train from, with the first team from then until the following pre-season. Uh, I had oh, three, three operations I had. Really? Uh, yeah, I had one in my hip. I had a hip arthroscopy. Um, and then I had two groin operations. Mm. Um, and Oldham had struggled. They didn't have a big budget and they'd struggled. I think we, we stayed up a couple of points. So my manager, so my manager gets sacked uh, and he brings in uh, Paul Dickov. So yeah. he, bring, he brings in Dickie and Tags. And I um, and, uh, spoke to Dickie because you know, I, I was only young when I was at Leicester yeah. with Dickie. You know, I, I, I used to play, he's like, I know you are, birds, blah, blah, blah. Something, oh, great. I got a fresh start here. Started yeah. training like a, a, I think it was a week later. Uh, Dickie calls me in. Chairman's giving him a list of seven players going on the transfer list, and you know I'm on it. Um, mm. So uh, so I'd never I'd never given a chance at Oldham, but I could understand it. Uh, yeah. And then Dickie said, "You know me, Perds. You know I'm a fair guy. If you're training well enough, you'll play. You know then you'll get a move." Blah blah. blah. Mm. 
a week later, I'd get thrown a bag of balls with like five other lads and it's gone play over there. Um, yeah. And like, and like, I was, I was, I was pissed at Dickie at that time yeah. because he knew me and he, I thought, well, you must know that I'm a hard worker and stuff like that. But yeah. then at the same time, I think his hands were literally tied. It's like, look, yeah. you're one in one out. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're one in one out. So if, if Bert is staying there on his wage, then you can't bring a player in. Mm. So I think he kind of had to play the game that, that most managers end up understanding that they have to do. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that was a, that was a tough fly. I think about two or three months. It was literally head tennis with the bomb squad, uh, a little bit of running, maybe a bit of shooting if we had a keeper. And then that was it, four or five days a week. Never made a squad, nothing. Yes. It, it, this is what I mean. This is what I want to get out there because obviously a lot of people don't really know. They don't hear these stories um, unless you're involved in the game. Like to me, what you're saying makes sense. And I've heard it so many times and I've been involved in situations like that. But from, from the outside looking in, the average layman's not going to be aware of that. I mean, obviously that must have been tough. And obviously you do need a level of mental strength to get through that. Um, when I was at Leicester, obviously, you know, when I made my debut at 18 and Obviously, kicked on. Martin O'Neill loved me, great manager and whatever else. Um, but then, obviously, he got the sack or he left to go to Celtic. Um, then Peter Taylor, I think it was Peter Taylor, came in and I was injured. Um, if you remember, I saw my fight in a reserve game. I think it was against Tottenham. Um, and I'd already played for the first team at that point. And then he came in. I just, I just knew he didn't fancy me. His backroom staff, they weren't really feeling me. I just, you know, when you get that vibe. Yeah, yeah. everyone knows everyone like when you're at a club everyone knows everyone and they know their nicknames and stuff so we had like Pipes and Jordan and you were known as yeah. Rose and whatever else and I was known as DT and I always remember one I think it was just before like a, a training match we had like a training match at Filbert Street and it was during pre-season and the coaches came in and they were like oh like, how are you doing Pipes how are you doing Jordan whatever else and they came to me and he just they just looked at me and walked away and I was just like, what, like, what, what is this about? Like, I'm not a bad egg or anything. Like, if you, if you don't want me, just say. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not like I was injured and feigning an injury. I had a hairline, sorry, I had a, a torn thigh. Um, and that kept me out for like, I think it was nine months or something. Um, so difficult times. And then, again, you mentioned on, mentioned, um, on about, like, obviously coming in and just being given, like, a bag of balls and stuff. I don't know if you remember at the time, because you... You may have been a bit too young, but I think it was when Mickey Adams took over from Peter Taylor. Um, yeah. Obviously, there was a few players there who either trying to get out or just weren't playing or whatever. And there was about a month period where I had to come in on a Sunday with like six or seven players just to do some shooting against Tim Flowers. And it was just like, what yeah. is this? And they do it on a Sunday, knowing that at that age, you probably want to go out on a Saturday and socialise, but you can't if you're going in on a Sunday morning. It was yeah. just ridiculous. And I just thought, this is pathetic. And then even at Hereford, that was a different time, slightly different scenario. I mean, I went there, wasn't fit, hadn't played all season, been into various clubs, just training and stuff. And as you know, you can go in and train all you want, but it's nothing in comparison. Uh, and I had to go in and prove myself. I remember speaking to uh, the assistant manager um, and he just said, look, yeah, come in. Obviously, we're aware of you, but you need to obviously play and stuff and obviously show what you can do. And you lot were flying, you're obviously all fit and I was just coming in. And obviously, ability takes you so far, but fitness, again, if you've got no match fitness, you're yeah, struggling yeah. anyway, especially with me. Mm. I was a winger, so I was always, you have to do something in the game, creative player and whatever else. And if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? Um, and I was playing for free there, so I'm travelling in every day and I'm travelling with you. Obviously, you're in the car school and stuff. And yeah. That was tough. I was just playing for free. Um, so, again, that's another thing that people sometimes don't see, and especially in the lowly. People are playing for free just to earn a contract. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just, it was difficult. I think that was really, as, as well as where some people with ability, where you see players just fall down the league, it's because they won't do that. You yeah. know, the, the, for them, well, no, I want a contract, stuff like that. I think uh, if you're brought up the right way to work hard first, then you've got that in you, you know, like you'll do that. It was yeah. the same. So I'm now 27, maybe 26, 27 at, uh, at Oldham. Look, you know, bag of balls. Uh, you're playing the reses, 
mm. um, there were seven of us and literally the chairman I think just pretty much said to Dickie and Tags you know look unless one goes out you're not bringing anyone in so mm. Dickie had to a little bit he couldn't make it happy for us because you know if I'm just messing oh yeah it's a great life I'm getting yeah. paid and I'm, I'm just messing around you know, mm. you know they, they've got to make it bad for you and then I uh, then my mate who I used to play with at Hereford got the Hereford job mm. uh, only temporarily he rang me like I need a left winger are you fit so I'm like yeah I'm fit he goes right well I've got to see you in a game because and then, you know and I'm not one part of me thought well come on pitch you know who I am mm. you know you know blah, blah blah so I kept, I drove down had a trial game you know behind closed doors match with Hereford they were trying to get a few off mm. and uh, and, uh, and played did all right he just wanted to see that I could get through 90 minutes it was quite a low paced game he only played them for about 60 in the end and then I started on Saturday for them against Stockport um, uh, scored after three minutes <laughs> honestly got my second after about 10 minutes wow. and then got after about 25 minutes yeah so um, yeah yeah like I, I played probably four re four resi games in well, probably 15 16 months that, that was it um, so well, I managed point, obviously when that happened you're just thinking wow like obviously you can't really get any better than that oh yeah yeah like obviously I go back to a club where I feel comfortable as soon as I I, I live in Hereford now you know, I'm from mm. Leicester I lived in Leeds when I played for Oldham and uh, yeah. Oldham I think I've, I've spent a lot of time in Manchester a lot of time in Birmingham so I'm, mm. I, I, could, I could have I could have liked to stay in a big city but I live in Hereford now I remember mm. just driving back and just feeling comfortable I've been here for five years I knew the ground. Uh, I've got like, especially now, even further down the line, I've got a, a little bit of respect around Hereford, you know, like yeah, people, yeah. people know me for what I've done for Hereford, mm. uh, Hereford and everything. Um, so, yeah, I did that first game uh, Christmas when the window came open. I ended up signing for Hereford a year and a half and managed to get my fitness back. And then after that year and a half, we got relegated from League Two. And I, 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 I mentioned earlier about good squads. It, it takes more than just the ability of the players. Yeah. So that season we got relegated from League Two. Six of us got moved to League One. Jeez. But, and, and that's unheard of. You know, yeah. if your team gets relegated, mainly you're just scrambling around to try and stay in that league because good, yeah. you know you've just been relegated because you're, you know, on the face of it, you're not good enough to stay in that league. Yeah. Uh, but six of us got moved, and it was. The old, my old, my original health manager, Graham, mm. took to you, you played with Forney. Yeah. Um, they, they were at Shrewsbury and they got promoted that year from League Two. Hereford got relegated, had a couple of good games against them. So they signed me for League One mm. uh, with Shrewsbury, which gave me a chance. Because I, I remember um, uh, Dickie saying to me, the chairman says, you, you won't come back from your injury. He said, you, you won't be the same player again. You know, you know, and without saying it to me, it was kind of like, look, chairman thinks you've done. Yeah, right, uh, you are. Yeah, you haven't kicked a football for a year since you've been here. Then you had your two months of summer before that, so you're 14 months down the line without kicking football. Um, so getting back into that League One for me was like, uh, was was that's what I wanted to do in my career. You know, after I left, after I left Oldham, right? Can I get back up to League One? Can I prove that I can get back? Yeah, I suppose yeah. you use that as motivation, don't you? Obviously, yeah, you know, again, you say thick skin, you use it as motivation or mm. it beats you down a bit and you don't come back yeah. from it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I managed to get back into the league on the shrews. I only spent a year there. Um, and then I probably made the only thing I'd change in my career. After that, I left Shrewsbury, spoke to Hereford again. They had a decent manager. Mm. They were in the conference still, but I just thought I wanted to go back and felt like I had a bit of unfinished business. Mm -hmm. uh, so I spoke to Hereford manager and he said, yeah, I said, yeah, no problem. I was going to wait till the end of the season so I could get my, because uh, I was still contracted to Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two days after I agreed with Hereford, Newport rang me, uh, just in Edinburgh. Yeah. And he wanted to sign me. He said, look, don't worry, we'll, we'll beat Hereford's offer. And uh, I said, look, I've said, I've said I'll go to Hereford. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll sort that. I'll ring in, blah, blah, blah. And we decided to stay true to my word. Mm. signed for Hereford um, and I, I shouldn't have you know looking back only because it didn't work out that year at Hereford I hated it mm. hated it worked under Martin Foyle I think I think he will say he didn't get the player that he was, that he thought he'd signed which I agree with that bad season yeah. well I didn't feel like I got the manager which I thought I was going to you know 
I respect yeah. him more than done during the game. I thought, oh, it'd be good to work with him. But we just didn't work together. Um, but if I just, uh, and you know, you say, like people say, play as long as you can. Someone would say to me, play as high as you can for as long as you can. Mm. It's a lot harder to work your way back up. Of course it is, uh, yeah. And I'm 31 now, so dropping out of the league at 31, I was never going to get back into it. Mm. Um, and I should have stayed with Newport, you know, a couple of years and, you know, had another couple of years in the league. Yeah. You know, you can. You know, it works in your future because of your pension, your, you know, you, that knock-on effect, you get a better deal somewhere else because you've come out of the league and, and, mm. and things like that. Um, so I had a year with Hereford, struggle, uh, probably my worst year. And then I went to, then I thought, right, well, because I'd lost that love for it, I was 32 now, I think I went to Tamworth. Mm. Uh, went to Tamworth for a year and really enjoyed my time there, but manager got sacked about six, six, seven weeks in and they gave me the job for, he said, however long you're going to get it. So I'm like, so, and, and this is what you talk about transferable skills. I'm comfortable talking with people. So I managed yeah. to get, there have been players in that dressing room, like, why the fuck has he got it? You yeah, know, they'll be playing, you know, they'll be playing and they're thinking, okay, we'll give them a chance. And I managed to get them rallied up. Uh, I only had a week with them, and then we brought in uh, uh, Morel. I remember the old Wrexham manager. Andy Morel. Uh, that's it, yeah. EK, EK. Yeah. Yeah, he was great, Mozza. Got on really well with him. But yeah. about two weeks after he came in, I ruptured my medial, uh, tore, tore it off the bone. Um, wow. Silly tackling, trailing with a trialist. I just went to kick it out. We were playing possession, you know, one team chasing. Yeah, ball, ball was a little bit loose, so I just thought I'll oh, just knock it out. I'm not gonna whack it out or anything. And as I went to knock it, he just literally just a little bit of a block tackle because I wasn't ready for it. My foot bent back and it opened my knee up. Oh, well, mate, the pain. Well, I mean, I've had I've had five ups in my career, but that that pain for that, God, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. And then and so for two weeks, I went away, and the pain kind of went. So I was like, oh. all right. So I started squatting. I was squatting like hundred kilos. Three mm. sets of that went back in, said, Oh, I think I'm ready to train. And he went, No, we've got your scan results. It's come off the bone. So I'm like, Well, how am I squatting then? He's like, Well, it's not on the bone. So you ain't, you ain't, you know, there's no pain there because it's just floating. Oh, and, what? Yeah. So, so, I was gonna, so they said it was a seven to nine month rehab. Um, and I, I did it right. I'd learned from my older one where I was out for 12 months. I did it right. And I ended up playing five and a half months after I did it. Really? Um, I wasn't fit, couldn't move. Like, yeah. um, and I played 90 minutes Saturday, Monday. I think I'd only trained twice. Because um, uh, I, I, I knew I had to get the last few games in of the season, else no one's going to touch me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I got the last five games in. Mother spoke to me. He said, he, he was like, ah, it's a hard one, person. I thought, I know what's going yeah. so on. Uh, so I said, look, mate, you haven't seen me fit. You've got a budget. Uh, you can't. I was on. You know, decent enough money for Tamworth at the time. Yeah, so that yeah. money had to go on somebody that he could trust. Of course, yeah. Um, so that happened. So I was, again, I was looking for a club. I got a lot of offers around that level type thing. And then Hereford had just been thrown out of the league. So they were starting mm. five five divisions lower. Yeah. Um, and I just had to, because I'd had that bad season with Hereford and then uh, had that bad injury. I just thought, I'll go there because I'll be comfortable again. I'll enjoy my football. Mm. And those those last three years, then that was before my retirement, and I loved it. We had a great set of lads. We won three leagues in a row to get back to the conference north as it is now. Yeah, uh, I think in those three seasons we lost in total. I think it was ten league games. Jesus, like we we had like hundred hundred thirteen points the first season, hundred seventeen points the second season. I think hundred six points the third. We were. Big, big, big budget, right yeah. manager, right player. We just, we just flew up. And, yeah. uh, and I think my pride when I first got down there was a bit like, well, this ain't going to count for much, you know. Mm. This is, I mean, we've been in football, so it's the first semi professional league. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back now, I loved it. We got to Wembley, played in the FA Bars final. Yeah, um, really everything. So, yeah, my, my career just. I had ups, downs, I had like four promotions, a relegation, yeah, yeah. Five, five operations, blew my knee out and that. Um, but I moved to finish on a high. Because I found yeah. the fire service, I, I retired. It wasn't like, oh, you're too old now. You're not fit enough. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> um, 
is my little girl. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Danny. Say hey. <laughs> I right. can't remember. I can't remember you playing football, but yeah, uh, you like playing football a little bit, don't you? What are you gonna do now? You need to put it. Yeah, no, you can't have to play. It's gonna be long though, okay? So yeah, you mentioned about your obviously coming into retirement and joining the, the fire service. I'm assuming that transition was a lot smoother than it would have been if it was out of your control. Yeah, because I think because I felt like it was on my terms, I didn't yeah. miss football. It, it's, it's weird. I think mean, football gets taken away from you. Mm. It's the same with everything in life. You yeah. want it back. You, you feel out of control. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think that's I something... That I think that's what I... I mean, my wife says it to me all the time. I'm a control freak. Yeah, uh, I think that probably was bred into you a little bit in football because you want to, you know, it's, it's up to me to play yeah. well, it's up to me to keep that place. Mm. Um, so when it's taken away from you, it's like a fight to get it back. Yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, like, so I think it was January, no, yeah, January I started in the fire service, so I still had two months left of, two or three months left of football. Luckily, the club were good with me, so they said, I think I missed three or four games because I just couldn't make the games because I was training for the fire service. Yeah. But they were good enough with me to say, look, yeah, look, you're it out. I announced I was going to retire and stuff. Mm. Um, and, and, and then looking at how I got into the fire service, mm. like you say, those skills that I'd got in football, I could translate onto my CV mm. and then use them for the fire service where a lot of people would just go, oh, well, I've, I can't do that. That's totally different. Yeah. There's no, there's no point. But everything that I could get over to the fire service, as in like, I think I remember in my CV, I was saying things like, you know, I know how to work in a team, mm -hmm. um, but I also know that my job has to be done right before I can go and help somebody else. Mm. Then in my interview stage with the, with the fire service, I could relate that and say, you know, there's times when uh, I know that my man's outside me. Mm. Uh, I feel like I'm covering that. Mm. Ball's broken there, I need to go and get it. Mm. And in the fire service, it's the same as I'm at a job, say if I'm at a flyer, and mm. I see that it's spreading somewhere or someone's struggling a little bit. Mm. Okay, well, I've done my job right, so mm. I reckon I can go and help him now. And little yeah. bits like that, little well, bits like that were, were massive for me in taking that jump from one job to another, which is such yeah. a vast, well, a vast thing. Well, this is what they always say. I always say, aside from having the transferable skills, it's knowing how to put them across in an interview or in a CV. It's pointless putting, okay, we obviously know you played football, right? But it's pointless saying, well, you played in this cup final or you won this medal or you made this amount of appearances because companies or, or people in other industries, they're not interested in that. They want to know what you can bring to their office, their, their company, their, um, obviously their organisation. So I will say research the field that you're going into research the role that you're applying for and then obviously put what they're looking for within your cv or your application and then you need exactly. to back that up during the interview as well yeah so, so for so for me it was like they want to see like you said how okay so i've won a i've won a cup final okay well how's that going to help us mm. and it's like well, in the semi-finals we were really struggling and mm. i was the captain so i'm the one who's trying to g us up we're losing 2-1 I can see that someone's struggling, so I'm trying to help him out, and then I'm making sure someone's got their head down, so I'm getting their head back up. Uh, and things like that, that that's my skill set from football, mm. that then they look at that and go, okay, so if, if we're at a job which is tough and it's not going very well, he's not going to go under. Yeah, exactly. he's, going to be, he's, going to be a, he's going to be someone who tries mm. to help somebody or yeah. get somebody to do something, you know, that, that type of thing. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and yeah, it is, it's just making sure that you can, transfer the reason why you've got that skill to the job which you're going to mm. um, uh, and you know I, I was a PT like you said for a good two or three years yeah. and again it was, it's easy to say oh he's, a, he's an athlete he's a, you know blah 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 but it's not it's me it's not I became an athlete because I did this so exactly. if you want to do that do that but it's also then saying you know that might not work for you so this is this is what you might need Exactly. Um, I think I think that's where a lot of probably ex pros come unstuck 
mm. because they they can't link it. You mm. know, I think I think you you'll agree. Anyone who's been a who's been a player, um, you know how to talk to people, don't you? You know, you, you you meet so many people, you interact with fans. I mean, that can that can go. You know, customer okay. service type. Thing. The amount mm. of times you interact with a fan, a fans ask you to do something. Okay, well. I haven't really got time, but I'll go out of my way to do this for them. And, yeah. and like that. Yeah. So there are so many transferable skills, but it's just linking, uh, linking them into the job that you're trying to get. That's it. You've also, you, you need to have the drive to do it as well. Because in football, sometimes it's easy to get caught in that football bubble. And for me, um, I've said this previously before, I always saw myself as me first and then a, a footballer second. And not everyone's yeah. like that. And what they don't want to do is, not not have to tell people that they're not playing anymore or not have to tell people that they're no longer wanted within the game anymore to save themselves face and it's like mm. i don't i can understand why that may be a situation but you need to see past that because at the end of the day there's, there's loads out there i mean i retired when i was 31 30 or 39 now so i've still got loads ahead of me in terms of life um, yeah so people don't really Sports people sometimes just get caught in that in that kind of fraternity that they're in and thinking, well, that that defines me as a person, so I need to stay in that for as long as possible. So yeah. In case. Yeah, I mean, I had, I had a year or two left. Um, I would say uh, when I, when I retired at 35, I felt fit, probably because I was at a level a little bit lower than what I yeah, came to fitness at, you know. Yeah. Um, and and I think I got my career through. My intelligence as a footballer. It wasn't my. I, I wasn't slow or anything. I'm. I'm small. Mm. You know. So I wasn't the fastest, but I had a bit of pace in that. But it was my yeah. intelligence. Mm. Um, so I still had that from the last two years. And the fire service. It was literally a case of look. You know, the fire service ain't going to be there in two years. Mm. Um, and, but yeah, like so, I left. Whereas I think if I had a stayed, especially the way the Hereford FC has gone now, I probably would have been given the manager's job or a chance yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I needed to cling on to it, well, wanted to cling on to it, I could have. Mm. But for me, I thought, you know, I, I think I got my head around the fact that football is a short, such a short sh- show mm. And you you pay now, you you know, Steve, you don't listen to people. Like when I was young, the amount of pros that would say, look, make sure you're doing something for your future. And yeah. You, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 no, yeah, I'll do that when I'm ready. But many mm. so players don't, it's just in one ear and out the other. To be fair, um, it, like I said, I, I did. I listened to a certain degree, but for me, I didn't want to detract away from trying to make it as a professional. So when I, after training, I, I'd want to go home and rest. Um, it's yeah. not like I was gallivanting around with friends and stuff, but I'd just go home and rest and rest up for training for the next day. I didn't want to yeah. go home and have to think about studying or, or learning another yeah. training. But, um, I said this in a previous conversation with someone else that, from a young age, probably 23, 24, I always thought, well, if I don't make it as a footballer, and when I say make, I mean to the highest level and sustain that for a period of time, which leaves me financially stable after the game, um, yeah. I'd need to go out and find a job. So I always had that innate in me thinking, well, I'm happy to go out and find an office job or whatever it may be to have a sustainable career going forward. Whereas a lot of people don't have that mentality. Now I just think, yeah. I, I need to play football for as long as I can. And, it just it annoys me to a certain degree when I see players now who are playing at 38, 39. Fair enough if you love the game and that that's fine, but just clinging on because they don't know how to come out of that like industry yeah. and then fulfil a career in another one. Um, it's just again, it just boils down to you as a person and obviously essentially the people you've got around you as well. Mate, that's a big thing, you know. Honestly, I think uh, I think a lot of a lot of players, you know, they have their wag, you know, and and I don't think that helps, you know, when yeah. when you get when you have that that woman on, like you, you fall in love with who you fall in love with, but mm. when but when you have that person on your arm and they they like or you might have seen, mate, how many girls when we were young were like, I want to, oh, oh, you're a footballer, oh, you're, and then all yeah. of a sudden they're interested in you. Yeah. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter mm. whether they whether they liked you before. It's like, oh wait. You're, you're, mm. you're, I think some people get to, and they get to 33, 34, 35, and the money's starting to go down. And then that woman is a little bit like, well, you know, they, I don't like this lifestyle as much anymore. Yeah. So well, I met my, my wife when I was 30, and she hates football. Uh, you know, she, <laughs> yeah. So that probably helped me a little bit because, um, 
because so when the fire service came up she was the one she messaged me and said was we were thinking about police fire because i wanted a career you know yeah yeah and she said oh the fire service blah, blah, blah. i sent me the cv through so she helped me that way mm. you know she she wasn't like and I'll, I've, I've met girls that would have been well no nah, look leave it for another two or three years because mm. you might get the help of job you mm. know and things like that and yeah I might have got released at the end of that oh, season. Yeah. You know, I have two years left. The manager might not have thought that. He yeah. might have thought, you know, he's done well, but I'm going in a different direction now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right. You've, you've got to, I mean, I was 30, 29 maybe, when I started to do my personal training. Mm. Uh, I started to get the wheels in motion for it. Yeah, so yeah. I knew, and then, then that means I could go part-time when I decided to, because, okay, well, I'm going to start building that up now. So I had that plan. Yeah, for yeah. me, looking for the fire service kind of like fell in my lap. Mm. Uh, you know, they, 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 they were hiring at the right time and I got in at the right time really for me. That was yeah. just almost a case of sheer luck and perfect timing. Mm. But I'd already because I'd planned to go into personal training. And I look back now and personal training is good fun and it keeps you fit. And it's, again, it's an easy thing to link with football. But yeah. at the same time, it's like down the line, well, uh if you think right okay so how hard is personal training because my first paycheck danny is like a non-football paycheck yeah uh, i was there uh, i was when i played for tamworth i was coaching heritage youth team i was like wow that is like not what i've been used to for 10 years yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, I yeah i remember thinking wow that's like just a, a you know an average normal wage mm. and i was like yeah yeah that kind of like hit me and go, right, okay, I need to work a little bit harder to make sure that when that football, because that football money had gone at 32, I'd have been screwed, you know? Yeah, that's it, yeah. So I made sure that when that football money went, my wage had built up enough. Mm. Yeah. And like a you know, fire, so it's, it's an unbelievable job being a fire. Really? You know? Talk to so, me about like your average day then, in the fire So we, we can have quiet days. Mm. Um, or you can have a day where say so, we go to like a marina fire, so there's three boats on fire, explosions heard and stuff. And you get on the boat, you have to moor them, put the fire out and that. You go to, we go to uh, car crashes, cutting yeah. cars you know, to extricate people and things like that. Um, you know, and, and it's just everything's different, mate. Um, uh, you, can, you can literally you go to a fire, you go to people stuck in a lift. Ambulance can't enter a house and they think somebody's falling in there or something, so we've got to get yeah. them in. Yeah, like my first job though is like stereotypical. I, I think I work two days, two nights, and then I get four off. Okay. Um, so the, the two days I didn't get a shout, we were quiet as anything. Mm. And then getting on my first on my first night, and uh, bells go at like five past six. So I'm straight down the pole, adrenaline yeah. buzzing. <laughs> and everything. Get on the pole, what is it? Animal rescue. So I'm thinking, right, like, flipping bull, horse, yeah. or something. And he goes, uh, I said, okay, what is it? He goes, it's a small animal. It's a cat up a tree. And I'm like, you're taking oh, wow. the piss. Said that to my boss, like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm taking the piss. Like, no, no, seriously, it's a cat up a tree. I'm like the most stereotypical joke for a firefighter, you know? Cat up a tree. So we, get, so we get there, the cat's dead. It's been up there for like a week. <laughs> so I'm up this ladder, cutting this branch down, yeah. wrapping up the cat and giving it to its owner and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's all different, but I work in the same crew, so there's five of us, so you get that camaraderie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of joking, a little bit of banter with you and that. You've got mm. to, obviously, you've got, to, you've got to change from the dressing room banter because... Yeah, tell me about it. You know, you know what I mean? Like, mm. I remember towards the end of my career thinking, wow, you can't take this banter into a normal workplace. <laughs> and especially, especially because, you know, times have changed as well, isn't they? PC yeah. now and everything like that. Yeah. It's totally different. Um, yeah, I work in an office, mate, and like we have banter and stuff, but yeah, it's nowhere on the scale of one to ten. I'd probably say football banter would be eight, nine, and then oh, yeah. banter now is probably four or five. Yeah, yeah. and oh. even football banter now, you know, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same severity as it was when I was sort yeah. of like early twenties. Yeah. Early twenties, you know, yeah. everything. Everyone's just giving it everybody. That's Whereas true. even even now, it's changed for the better, you know. In the, in the, yeah, yeah. And it goes on on that mm. but uh but yeah so the fire service i think as well for those first two years i've just come out of two years now in the fire service and uh it's like a it's a it's a job where i have to concentrate i've got to know my job mm. i've got to learn i've got to get better if something isn't quite good enough for a fire or a car crash i've got to hammer myself to get it right the next time 
that that like you, or is that like a team? Uh, it's a it's it's a bit of both. You know, we train. So if we're not at a job, we're training. We're doing something to look okay. to help uh, um, And uh, and that for me is saved me from coming out of football as well. It's made me not miss it yeah, because yeah. you know you, you have a bad game or or a opponent gets the better of you, then you go away and you think right next time I need to be a little bit better. Mm. I've got to get better with it. And it's the same in the fire service. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then every time the bells go, it's that adrenaline rush, which I think has a lot of problems when footballers stop playing football. Mm. It's that they don't get that adrenaline. They don't get that, that, uh, that competition anymore. Mm. Um, and yeah. you, know, you see the statistics where people will turn to uh, gambling or alcohol because that's their, that's like yeah. their budget. Just to get that high. Yeah. So I get the buzz, you know, bells go down the pole, get down, what is it? You know, it's a, it's a car fire, it's a tractor fire, it's something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's, it's a good job. Like I said, I got lucky with it, real lucky with it. Yeah, yeah. Do you get to drive the engine or? Not yet. I've got, I can do my driving now that I'm out that first yeah. two years. I can oh, start okay. to do the driving. Problem is, if you do the driving, you're always doing radio messages. You don't actually go into the fire or. Oh, really? Anything. Yeah, man, I'm still so nervous about getting on the radio because it's it's proper like, uh, oh, it's proper like YB four six one assistance message over. I can't just go look, mate. We need another fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all coding and stuff. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and it's like the phonetic alphabet. So if you've got to spell something, I can't just go like A for apple and B for, yeah. you know what I mean. So yeah, it's a uh, and it goes to it goes to every single fire engine as well in the service. Oh so. wow. That's what I'm worried about. Now I'll start stuttering. Wow. Now that's class, man. I'm happy for you. That sounds. Uh, I mean, from go from playing professional football to the standard that you did for as long as you did, and then obviously going into the fire service. That's massive. Uh, and that just yeah. goes to show. Obviously, if you've got the drive, uh, the willingness to go and seek something, and obviously you can showcase your transferable skills. And obviously, that there, there's something out there for everyone, really. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Essentially, what I'm trying to. Uh, make everyone aware of um but yeah i mean thanks for your time today Kurt. obviously nice catching yeah, up yeah. again um hope everything goes well going forward for you and everything else and then we'll go from there really hopefully catch up soon as we always say <laughs> as we always say that yeah i bet we'll get a night out we'll get a night yeah. out yeah <laughs> never happens <laughs> <laughs> all right mate well i'll catch you soon anyway yeah cheers dude right. see you soon thanks a lot bye, mate. Yeah, bye.